Well, good morning, church family. We want to welcome you here to our morning worship service at 11 a.m. as we gather together to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are here for no other purpose. We were created, created for that purpose, to praise and worship our Lord and Savior. And if you're joining us online, we're glad that you've chosen to join us as well as we worship together. In just a moment, we're going to sing our welcome chorus, and after that, the pastor is going to lead us in our a call to worship. And But before all that, let's take just a moment to stand and speak to those around us. Speak to your neighbors and tell them you're glad to see them here at church this morning. As you continue to greet one another, let's sing that chorus together. Holy Spirit, thou art welcomed in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, thou art welcome. Indeed, he is. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 99. The Lord is king. Let the nations tremble. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. The Lord sits in majesty in Jerusalem, exalted above all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Exalt the Lord our God, bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Please join me in our prayer of invocation. Lord, we just thank you for your, this word to our hearts today, reminding us that regardless of the upheaval in our nation or among the nations, that you alone reign over all this earth. And thank you that our King, Jesus Christ, has won the victory over sin and death. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Please come and help us to represent you well this day, for you are holy. We bow down before you, and we worship and exalt your great name. Amen. We're going to sing number 16 in your hymnals, O Worship the King, the first, second, and fourth verses. Let's all stand as we sing this morning. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm. 
privilege it is to go to our Lord in prayer as a church family. This prayer is dedicated to the events that happened 21 years ago. This day, September 11th, 2001. So please join me in a moment of silence before we pray. God of grace and God of glory. The world still surges with violence. The wars never end. Assure us, Lord, that one day all crying and mourning and suffering and evil and death will be no more. In the midst of afflictions, Lord, whether they are our own or that of the world, we need you to speak again, Creator God your words of life and your words of hope over us. Comfort those who grieve. Strengthen those who struggle. Heal those who hurt. Assure those who worry. Support those who defend. Free those who are oppressed. And disrupt those who hate what is good and plot evil against you. Father, we think for a moment of all the heroic acts accomplished by the first responders and regular citizens on that day. Some of them paid the supreme sacrifice. And as we remember them, we also remember Jesus Christ paid the supreme sacrifice for us so that we could be set free. And in commemorating this tragedy, may we remember that your faithfulness is forever and learn to trust in your unfailing love. Lord, just gather up all the fragments of our lives and bless them and then use them in ways that bring your light and love to others and honor and glory to your name. May our acts of mercy and grace on your behalf reveal your desire and your power to bring redemption and reconciliation and resurrection out of death and despair. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, who is the light of the world, the Prince of Peace, the Good Shepherd, our Helper, Redeemer, and Friend. Amen. Show me what I've never seen. 
Lord, I want to be your witness. You can take what's wrong and make it right. Day star shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the night. Lord, I see a world that's dying, wounded by the master of deceit. Groping in darkness haunted by the years of past defeat but when I see you standing near me Lord shining with compassion in your eyes I pray Jesus shine us with that song. We're going to continue our worship and song now. We're going to stand together and sing, This is my Father's World, the first, second, and third verses in the holy ground. Let's all stand as we sing. my 
is in the Bible, especially the one that says, where two or more are gathered, I will be there. And if I'm looking around, we've got two or more gathered here today. So we know he's here. Not only is he here, his angels are flying around. I firmly believe when we're worshiping God, he comes to listen to us sing. He dwells and lives in the praise of his people. Let's sing that chorus one more time. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us pray. Maybe.
Welcome back to our series in the Psalms. Over the last five weeks, we've looked at some of these songs that help walk us through the different seasons of our lives. We looked at Psalm 1, which taught us how to have our faith watered in every season. We looked at Psalm 23, which is the psalm of God's promised provision in every circumstance and season of our life. We looked at Psalm 78, which is the psalm for the season of passing our faith on to the next generation. And then there was Psalm 122, which is the psalm for seeking God. And Psalm 96, which is our song for the seasons of singing and rejoicing. Today we're going to complete our series with a psalm by the most seasoned writer of all. Any guesses? Moses. How about that? Moses is one of the most impressive men in all of history, from the palace to the desert to the wilderness. He lived to be 120 years, and he saw it all. I want to tell you his story today. I want to share his song with you as he reaches the end and he looks back on his life. The story of Moses reads like a movie, well, which is probably why so many movies have been made about him. Ten Commandments, anybody? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah, I think pretty much everyone knows the story, so I'm just going to do a very, very quick recap here, just in case you're not familiar with it. So Moses is born to a Hebrew slave family. They live in Egypt, and all the Hebrews in Egypt are slaves. And he was born at a time when the Pharaoh, that's the king of Egypt, had decreed that all young Hebrew boys should be killed. They were getting overpopulous, and he wanted to kind of thin that population down. Moses' mother, mother believed that he was a special boy, and so she hid him until it was too dangerous for her to do so. Then she placed him in a basket, lined it with tar and pitch, and had her daughter put it into the Nile River near where the Pharaoh's daughter bathed. And sure enough, the Pharaoh's daughter spotted the basket, uh, had it retrieved, and uh, Moses' sister was right there to say, hey, listen, I know of a nursemaid who just lost her son, <laughs> and she can wean him for you if you like. So uh, the Pharaoh's daughter actually paid Moses' own mother to raise him for those first few years of his life, and I'm sure she poured into him all that she could about the history and the faith of her people. When Moses got a little bit older, she brought him back to the Pharaoh's daughter, and the Pharaoh's daughter adopted him to be her own son. So Moses grew up as a prince of Egypt. He's well-educated, well-read. He speaks multiple languages, understands history, geography, philosophy, mathematics, and military strategy. But through it all, Moses also knew that he was a Hebrew. And so he goes back and he starts to visit his people. On one of those visits, he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. And when he thought it was safe to do so, he killed that Egyptian and then buried him in the sand. Well, he goes back the next day to visit with his family and, and his people. And he sees two Hebrew men fighting each other, and he goes to break up that fight, and one of them says to him, what are you going to do, kill, kill us too, like you did that Egyptian yesterday? And Moses knew that he had been discovered, and sure enough, it wasn't long before the Pharaoh of Egypt found out about that, and he placed a decree in order to have Moses killed. But Moses escapes. He runs, he flees to a distant land of Midian. And at this point, Moses is 40 years old. I mean, he's lived like a prince for 40 years. All he's known is the palace life, but he's about to be shown now the simple life. And so for the next 40 years, he tends sheep for his father-in-law in the land in the desert of Midian. He's there as a refugee in exile. And then something very strange happens. Exodus 2 and 23 tells us that years passed and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. So God sends Moses a message, special delivery, one that he can't refuse, as the saying goes. And God appears to Moses in a burning bush. The bush is burning, but it's not burning up. And Moses said, this is weird. I have to go in for a closer look. And when he does, that is when God speaks to him. And he says, Moses, I want you to go and tell the Pharaoh, go to that new Pharaoh and tell him to let my 
people go. Of course, well, Moses is not too keen on that idea. He said, listen, I know this guy. I grew up with him. He's my stepbrother. <laughs> and there's no way that I will be able to go and tell him to release two million slaves, which are his entire economic system. And besides, I'm 80 years old now. I've gotten pretty used to the simple shepherd life. I'm in my comfort zone, and I don't want to move out of that. But after a lot of discussion, God promises, well, listen, Moses, if you go, I will go with you. And Moses spends the next 90 days trying to convince Pharaoh that it is in his best interest to emancipate his entire slave force. Well, Pharaoh doesn't bite. We didn't expect him to. So God, who is always creative, gives the Pharaoh 10 visual aids to persuade him. And finally, Pharaoh relents. All right, you can go. <laughs> and with that, the Israelites spend the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And Moses spends that next 40 years as their shepherd and prophet and caregiver and liberator, nursemaid, lecturer, nation builder, and most importantly, as an intermediary between them and God. And over these 40 years, Moses writes the first five books of the Bible. That's 50% more material than any other biblical author. And finally, after 40 years of wandering and writing, after all that he's observed, after all that he's experienced, all that he's seen of God and of people, he writes one last page. This isn't about Israel's history, not about their genealogy, not about the law, the commands. No, it's a song. And we know this song as Psalm 90. This is the oldest of the Psalms. It predates the others by at least 500 years and then more. And it forms the pattern after which all the other Psalms were written. It's simply called a song of Moses or a prayer of Moses. Let's check it out. Oh, Heavenly Father, speak, Lord. We, your servants, are listening. Moses writes, Lord, throughout all generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world from beginning to end, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. For you, a thousand years are as a passing day, as a brief as a few night hours. You sweep people away in, like dreams that disappear. They're like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it's dried and withered. We wither beneath your anger. We're overwhelmed by your fury. You spread out our sins before you, even our secret sins, and you see them all. We live our lives beneath your wrath, enduring our years with a groan. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to eighty. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble, and soon they disappear and we fly away. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of our delays of our life so that we may grow in wisdom. O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servant. Satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love so that we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us, your servants, see you work again. Let our children see your glory. And may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes make our efforts successful. All right, let's start at the top and walk through this together, shall we? Verse 1 begins with the word Lord, which is Adonai. In Hebrew, Adonai means a ruler or a king. Now, another frequent word for God in the Bible is Elohim, which is translated as supreme one or mighty one. That's the word that Moses used to describe God when he saw him in the burning bush. And when you see the word LORD in all capital letters, L-O-R-D, that's the Hebrew word for Yahweh, which is the covenant name that God gave to Moses when Moses said, well, who shall I say <laughs> sent me? 
And God says, you tell them I am sent you. That is my covenant name with you and your people. So there's your Hebrew lesson for the day. Adonai, Moses says, Lord our ruler, Lord our king. You have been our refuge in every generation. And in these first two verses, Moses is saying, God is great. That's our first point today. God is great. Verse 1, he's our refuge. He's our fortress. He's the one who protects us from our enemies. Verse 2, he's our creator. He gave birth to the earth. And also in verse 2, he is forever from beginning to end, alpha to omega. God is forever. He is God forever. Moses grew up surrounded by greatness. He was raised in the great palaces of Egypt. His grandfather was the great pharaoh of all Egypt. And for the first 40 years of his life, everyone bowed to Moses and told him how great he was. But after spending 40 days on Mount Sinai, Moses learned who was truly great and who wasn't. Ninety days after leaving Egypt, the Israelites arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai. And God summons Moses to come up the mountain so he can establish his covenant with his people. And here's what happened. I'm just going to read you a couple of verses from Exodus 19. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed, and a dense cloud came down out on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled in fear. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire, and the smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and all the whole mountains shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. Can you picture that scene? See, this is God. He is big. He is powerful. He is majestic. He is glorious. He shakes mountains, and he speaks like thunder, and when he does, the people tremble at his majesty. Philip Yancey tells the story of his first trip to Yellowstone National Park. He went to see Old Faithful, and he stayed in a hotel which overlooks that geyser, and there's a restaurant there with a big window where the diners can watch when it erupts. And just about that time, all the diners got up to leave their tables, and they went to the window to watch the geyser, to watch Old Faithful. But Mr. Yancey noticed that none of the staff even flinched. They didn't even look in direction of the window. You see, sometime over the years, somewhere along the line, they had stopped being impressed, and they took that natural wonder for granted. How many of us have the same attitude towards the supernatural wonder and the greatness of God? We become self-absorbed. We become engrossed in the monotonous drone of our daily lives, our routines. We become distracted by the latest crisis or the latest cause. And we fail to be amazed at God's majestic glory which surrounds us every day of our lives. See, that was God's purpose from the beginning, to saturate the universe with his greatness and his glory. What Moses found out on the mountaintop was that God is great. He is majestic. He is glorious. And what Moses found out in the valley, <laughs> it's our second point today, <laughs> he is not. We're not. We're not great. Verses 3 to 6 tell us we're frail. We return back to dust. We're swept away like a fleeting dream or a withering blade of grass. Verses 7 to 8 tell us that we're fallen. We wither beneath God's righteous and holy anger. He sees all of our sins, even our secret ones. Nothing escapes his eye. The piece of candy you took when you were 8 years old? Yeah, God saw that. How about the time you disrespected your mother when you were a teenager and you knew everything? Mm-hmm, saw that too. Maybe when you pushed one of your siblings down or pretended it was an accident, they believed you, but God knew. Yeah, he saw that. He saw it all, and he sees it all. But here's the good news in that. In these verses and also throughout the Bible, we also see that God is our creator. He's our life giver. He is our redeemer. He's our eternal refuge. You see, he knows us, and he knows we're not perfect. He knows we can't be perfect on our own, no matter how hard we try, <laughs> although we do, which is why God sent his son to rescue and redeem us from all of our sins. 
Verses 9 to 10 tell us that we are finite. Even our best years are filled with pain and trouble, and after that we die. Wow, how depressing is that, huh? But you know what? It's also encouraging when you think about it. It's encouraging when we learn to grasp <laughs> that life is not about us. It's not about you and me. Never has been, never will be. It's about God who is in us and with us and for us throughout all the pain and the suffering in our lives. So for 40 years, Moses lived with upper-class Egyptians. And then for another 40 years, he lived with working-class Midianites. And then for the last 40 years, he lived with lower-class slave, former slave, Israelites. And in the end, he concludes, we're all the same. People are people. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter what you do. We're all the same. We're all frail. We're all fallen. And we're all finite. God is great, and we are not. And that is the theme of Moses' final song. That's not meant to be an insult. It's only meant to diagnose reality. Because sometimes we can deceive ourselves into thinking that we're really something when we're really not. Which is why Moses said, this is our third point, we need to have the right perspective on life. Verses 11 to 12 say, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. In other words, teach us to number our days so that we may spend them wisely. If you grew up in church, then you probably know that song, Jesus Loves Me, right? Jesus loves me, this I know. Come on, sing it with me. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, he does. We teach that song to our children so they get to know about a God who is loving and a God who is strong and a God who will always be there for him when they need help. And children need help. They know they need help, which is why they're always asking grown-ups for help. The child can grasp that concept. That God is strong and God is loving and God is always there to help them. But here's what happens. Something changes as we get older. We don't need help from grown-ups anymore. Well, at least we pretend we don't. We start to feel more independent. And along with that, we also begin to think that we don't need God as much as we're used to anymore either. That's some stinking thinking right there, church. That's why Jesus said you can only enter God's kingdom as a child. He doesn't want you to come to him as a mature adult. He wants you to come to him as a child and recognize your helpness, helplessness, and his ability to help you in your need. And that's why we need to cry out to him and say, Lord, <laughs> Help me to see my life the way it really is. Give me some perspective on your greatness and my weakness so that I can grow in wisdom and spend every day in a way that honors and glorifies you, in a way that you intended me to live. So if Moses' conclusion is we need perspective, then his application of that is, well, once we get perspective... We ought to acknowledge that God really can help us and then go to him for help. Moses' application to God's greatness and our smallness is our fourth point. Ask God for big things because he can handle it. This is the final paragraph of the song. In his final five verses, Moses prays five prayers, and these are all go big or go home kind of prayers. Pray, big prayer number one comes from verse 13. Turn and have compassion on me. Come back to me, Lord. Don't delay, he says. Have pity on me and my helpless condition. And that's the most important prayer that you can pray. It's the first prayer that you have to pray, that you must pray, if you want God to hear you and respond to you with his compassion, with his love in action. Follow this for a minute. We're frail, which means we're not strong. We're finite, which means we don't last long. And we're fallen, which means we've all done things that are wrong. And all those wrong things, they pile up 
and they pile up and they pile up and they sit there before God's throne and they have to be dealt with. God is righteous and God is holy and he just can't let those things pass. And here's why he can't let those things pass. Let's use children for example. Let's just say a child of yours breaks something. It doesn't belong to them. And it was an intentional breaking. They were angry and threw something down and broke it. Now you can make them pay to replace that. Or you can say, yeah, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. But it is a big deal. You see, if your child never learns behavior, that behaviors have consequences, then he or she will grow up emotionally and spiritually stunted and crippled because that child never learns to regret the things that they have done wrong or make amends with the person who they have wronged. So when you wrong someone, yes, it is a big deal. It can't be ignored because it would diminish you to ignore it. No, you've got to ask for forgiveness. Otherwise, you just become a distorted image of the kind of person that God created you to be. You still following? All right, let's take this a step further in. When you do something wrong to another person, the more important that person is, the bigger the deal it is. Let's use a, it's football season. Let's use a football game for an example. There's a high school football game being played and tempers flare, things get heated and one player punches another in the face and breaks his nose. That's not good. It's a big deal. It can't be ignored. Something needs to be done. You need to ask forgiveness. You may need to pay restitution to pay medical bills. You're probably going to have to humbly accept, not just accept, but humbly accept some form of punishment of some kind, whether it's a game suspension or a school suspension, or maybe even community service or a fine because uh, charges were pressed. But now let's say the coach runs in to intervene and you punch him in the face. And then comes the high school principal and you do the same with her. And then comes the police officer to intervene and oops, <laughs> yeah, now you've gone from a misdemeanor to a felony. Now it's not just a big deal, now it's a really big deal. The more important the person, the greater the crime when you read about the Israelites and all the stuff that they did in the wilderness, you see that they were punching God in the face all the time. God told them, hey, listen, don't make any idols to replace me. And the moment Moses went up on top of Mount Sinai, what they do? They all pull their gold earrings out of their ears, right? And, and shape the golden calf so they could bow down and worship that. God gives them manna to eat. It's a wondrous food. It lasted for 40 years. And what? They complain and they whine and they moan because they don't have what they had back in Egypt. God gives them Ten Commandments to obey and they break every single one of them on a regular basis. See, Moses knows that he's dealing with a big bunch <laughs> of big rule breakers. So if they are going to pray big prayers, they first have to ask God to forgive them. They have to get into a right relationship with him. That was done in the Old Testament through surrender and sacrifice. In the New Testament, thanks to Jesus Christ, he surrendered and sacrificed so that we could be forgiven by God. But that's what Moses is doing when he prays in verse 13. He's saying, have compassion on your servants. You know how frail and fallen and finite we are. Moses is asking for God's forgiveness. He's admitting that they need it. And he's humbly asking for it. That's the first prayer that we need to pray for all the other prayers to work. God, forgive me. Have you done that yet? Have you taken that first step and prayed that prayer and say, Lord, please forgive me for the sins in my life. You know, I can't take care of all this myself. I'm coming to you as a child, acknowledging that I need you to help me. Would you please help me? He'll always answer a prayer like that. Big prayer number two, verse 14. Satisfy me with your love and joy. There's four words for love in the New Testament. The one you may have heard the most is agape love, which is unconditional love. And there's several words for love in the Hebrew Old Testament as well. The Hebrew word that Moses uses for love here is the closest one to agape love. It's the word hesed. There's love and then there's hesed love. 
When you see the word hesed in the scriptures, it's always translated with two words. In the New Living Translation, which I am reading from today, it's called unfailing love. Your version may use steadfast love or faithful love. God's hesed love is a love that will never leave you or let you go. Satisfy me each morning with your unfailing hesed love so that I can sing for joy for the rest of my life. Now that's a really big prayer. Instead of praying for a new robe that'll make him happy for a few days or a new chariot that'll make him happy for a couple of weeks, no, Moses prays for God to give him joy so that he can be happy for a lifetime. Just imagine if you could have the kind of joy that would never leave you. What did James say? You have not because you ask not. Few things in life are guaranteed. But I can guarantee that you will never have that everlasting joy from God if you don't ask Him for it. And you'll never find it on your own either, although we try to do that too, don't we? We look all over the place for it. But only God can grant you, through Jesus Christ, only God can grant you His hesed love and His everlasting joy. Big prayer number three, verse 15. Make up for the pain of my past. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. That's a big prayer because everyone in Moses' generation had been a slave all their lives. And everyone in the next generations that are coming up behind had wandered in the wilderness all they've lived. All they have knew was pain and suffering. I like how the Passion Translation puts it. It says, we've been overwhelmed with grief. Now come and overwhelm us with gladness. Replace our years of trouble with decades of delight. In 1972, a man used a hammer to attack the Pieta. The Pieta is a statue sculpted by Michelangelo. It's in St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. It's a beautiful, beautiful sculpture. It's a picture of or an image of Mary who's holding Jesus after he was taken down from the cross. And this statue was severely damaged. But this priceless work of art was not discarded just because it was broken. In fact, just the opposite was true. No effort, no cost was spared to restore that statue as much as humanly and completely as possible. Now, if that's the lengths that we will go to to repair and restore an inanimate creation, imagine the lengths that God will go to to restore you, His living breathing creation even while you didn't know him even while you were his enemy he sent his son Jesus to die for you there is nothing 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 he will not do for you it's never too late for him to redeem or replace or restore he is the God of impossibilities he doesn't make all things new he makes all things better than new when we come to him in surrender and trust Big prayer number four, verse 16. Let me see how you are at work. Looking back on his life of pain and suffering, Holocaust and concentration camp survivor Viktor Frankl wrote, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Church, we of all people have a why to live. (laughs) Which means... I can put up with pain and suffering in my life as long as I can see that God is doing something with it. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever said that? Some of you are going through that right now, I know. There's pain in your life, but you have seen God accomplishing His purposes and His plans in and through your pain and suffering. And it makes the journey with worthwhile. And that's where your focus needs to be, by the way. Not on, oh, who did this to me and how can I get out of it as quickly as possible? But Lord, please use this pain and suffering, use this circumstance, use this season of my life to bring honor and glory to your name. Work in and through my pain and suffering to bring healing to the lives of others. That's what Jesus did. And that's where your focus needs to be because that is where God will meet you and accomplish impossible things in and through your life. And then there's our last prayer, big prayer number five. And this is a huge one because it's really a prayer for a lifetime. He asks the Lord, verse 17, 
Make something significant from my life. Don't we all want that? We all want to be known for something when we leave this earth? The Hebrew translation for that verse is, May the favor of the Lord, our God, rest upon us. Establish for us the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. The work of our hands cannot be established by an eternal God unless it involves eternal objects. And the only eternal objects in this world are people, you and me, (laughs) and God's word. The work of our hands is helping people who do not know God to get into a right relationship with him through Jesus Christ, his son. That's the only work that will last for a lifetime. You can have your name on a building, but it's not going to last for eternity. Only this will. And that's my prayer. My prayer for you and my prayer for me and our prayer for us that God would establish the work of our hands in this community through his church here at Timberlake Baptist. That is the prayer that will keep us going, and that is the prayer that will keep us growing, church. Maximum prayer, maximum effort, and maximum involvement to advance God's purposes and plans right in this community and bring back the king. Every one of you is called to that. There's no exceptions, and every one of you is needed for that. The harvest is great, but the workers are a few, Jesus said. Yeah, from the palace to the desert to the wilderness, Moses experienced the faithfulness and the power of God throughout all the seasons of his life. That same faithfulness and power are available to you and to me throughout our seasons as well. He makes it possible through Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all. So what's the one big thing you need to ask of him today? What's that one big thing? Maybe it's forgiveness, or love, or mercy, or grace, or provision, or healing, and that can take many forms. Maybe it's freedom from bondage, or wisdom, or restoration, or purity, or or power, (laughs) to accomplish eternal things for God's kingdom and glory. Maybe it's salvation. That's just a fancy word for saying, Lord, (laughs) I can't do this on my own. I need you to help me. Jesus was clear. The Bible is clear. The bigger you ask, the more recognition and glory God receives. And the more opportunities others have to see his greatness and his goodness. So go ahead, ask big, pray big prayers. Use God's word as your standard and guide and don't forget (laughs) to sing your praises to the maker of all for he delights to answer you. Let's go to him now in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm just going to pause for a moment and allow this church family to ask big things of you. How refreshing it is to know that you desire to help us. And the bigger and the more impassable and possible our prayer seems to be, the more it delights you because we are recognizing that you are great and we are not. So come, Holy Spirit, and minister to every single person here today who is listening today, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you to accomplish big things in and through our lives. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of commitment today is There is a Fountain, number 142 in your hymnals. We're going to sing the first, second, and third verses. Let's all stand as we sing. Yeah. 
standing for the benediction and our final chorus is an old saying that goes life begins after you move out of your comfort zone or at the end of your comfort zone Moses found that to be true and my prayer for you this week is just simply <laughs> your community awaits you church so go move out of your comfort zone whatever it takes and make disciples for his kingdom and glory God bless you all our closing chorus is The King is Coming. Oh, the King is coming. The King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding. 